Welcome to ASM Live from Microbe 2017 in New Orleans. I'm Jeffrey Malloy. And I'm Stanley Malloy. And today we're going to discuss some of the most exciting stuff going on at Microbe 2017. If you're in the audience and you want to ask a question, please use the microphone at the back. And if you're watching online, please post any questions to the feed on Facebook. The three guests that we have today represent a really important aspect of microbiology. One of the guests represents simplicity. How you use really simple concepts to understand microbiology. The next guest does something a little more complex, uses a model organism to look at a very complicated process. And the third guest actually gets out in nature and looks at it in all of its complex glory. So we see the entire span of microbiology in our three guests today. So our guests today are Julie Terrio from Stanford University, Lalita Ramakrishnan from Cambridge University, and Rebecca Vega Thurber from Oregon State University. So Julie, you talked about using simple physical models to understand really important aspects of bacteria. And of course, throughout your career, everyone knows you for the beautiful videos <laughs> that, that tell us a lot about biological processes. Mm -hmm. We don't have that option today. So if you're going to talk about videos, you're going to have to I'll paint have to a gesture. picture in the air. Okay, okay. sounds fine. So one of the key ideas that you talk about in your, in your discussions of, of, of physical principles in microbiology you talk about the idea of using deliberately oversimplified models to help explain seemingly complex processes in bacteria. Right. So this isn't necessarily an intuitive idea to a lot of people. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. So uh, there's many different ways to think about using physics and using physical approaches to try to understand complex biological systems. And the particular viewpoint that I was talking about uh, the other night was something that um, I've developed in collaboration with some wonderful uh, colleagues, Rob Phillips, uh, Yane Kandev, and Ernan Garcia. We wrote a book together about doing physical modeling for biology, specifically from this perspective of trying to figure out what is the simplest take that you can have on any given complex biological system. Not necessarily as a way to fully explain it, but as a starting point so that you can focus, uh, focus the precision of your questions. Uh, and I'd say in general, you know, when you look at something, even something very complicated, a good biologist will usually have some sort of intuition about what kinds of things might be going on. And so the reason for advocating in favor of these kinds of simple physical models is basically a challenge to take the intuition that you have and try to make it really explicit and really formal. That if you think something is growing exponentially, okay, what does that look like quantitatively? And what are the quantitative predictions you can make from just making that simple model explicit? And so are there, are there some examples you have of when a, a simplified physical model has been good enough and when a physical model has helped guide more targeted mechanistic studies? Sure. Um, so I'd say I, one that, that leaps to mind recently was a project done by a graduate student of mine, Lee Harris, who just recently finished up, where uh, she was looking at a series of mutants that had been generated by a previous graduate student, Natalie Dye where they were all point mutations in a single protein in Colobacter, and they would have wildly different shapes, even just with single amino acid changes in this one protein. And some of the shapes were, you know, just sort of bigger, or longer, or skinnier or something than the normal cells, but some of them were very crazy with, like, protrusions that were different widths from the main part of the cell, and two daughter cells from a single division could have very different shapes. And it was sort of driving us crazy because it looked so random what the bacteria were doing, but, uh, if you took a single bacterium, regardless of what its, its size or shape was, grew up a whole colony, then the distribution of shapes would be the same as what you started with. So the bacteria were doing something regular, but we just had no idea what it was. And so she spent a couple of years actually just making very careful measurements, quantitative measurements of all of the different aspects of their growth with the assumption that there was going to be something that they were keeping constant. And it turned out the answer was uh, what they were keeping constant was their surface area to volume ratio, regardless of any of these other you know, sort of bits of craziness. And so then that led us to begin to explore how that can actually be measured and regulated in bacteria. Interesting. So Lalita, you, you talked about using a model system, zebrafish, to understand mycobacterium leprae's infection process. And of course, that's a causative agent of leprosy. And 
understanding that's been really difficult because there isn't a very good pliable model for dissecting the system. So it, it's a great example of where you need a model system to be able to understand the process. And it, a core part of this is that if you don't have a good system to study it, some of what we thought was true might just be plain wrong. Yeah, I think um, I, I think the main issue with models is, I mean, ultimately we're all we're modeling stuff no matter what we where we look. Even even humans could be considered a model because not every human is like another human. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it's often just a question of selecting the model that you want to use. So ultimately, leprosy has been studied in models. It's been studied in cell culture models. It's been studied in the foot pad of mice. It's been studied in nude mice. So models have been used. And all we did was to say, here's a question that might be better addressed in this particular model, the zebrafish, because we can actually see what's going on. And we can actually look at the nerves and we can look at the bacteria interacting with the nerves to see if and how they damage the nerves because nerve damage is the quintessential pathological hallmark of leprosy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so I, I really do think that that's selecting a model and always contextualizing it to as best as you can um, to sort of the real thing is, is sort of a, 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 a key to understanding pathogenesis. So one question when you have a model system is how you started using that model. Did you use that model in this organism because you were familiar with the model and so you saw this opportunity? Or because you were interested in the organism and you needed to find a model? Well, um, so I'm an infectious disease physician. so. Um, le leprosy is one of the most fascinating infections there is because for one thing it's the, really the only bacterial infection that causes nerve damage and as you know we've known it since medieval times and nobody's really understood it. Now I got into the zebrafish to model tuberculosis and, and I did that many years ago um, because my, both my intuition and my reading told me that it would be a good model. And it turned out to be an excellent model. And so all along I had been thinking that I would like to turn to, to, to the same model to see now if, it's, if the very attributes that had helped us understand TB could now be used to understand leprosy. And in particular, the model had already been used by neurobiologists to study nerves, particularly nerve, de nerve development. So, you know, how myelination occurs and so on. So, so you know, it was, it was, it, it, it was we were already primed to, to now address the, the, the questions of disease pathogenesis in the model. So I would say the answer to your question is, is both. I knew the model. I, had a pretty good feeling that we had a good chance of understanding disease pathogenesis and had always been fascinated by the, di the disease, by leprosy. It's the old Pasteur quote, chance favors the prepared <laughs> mind. That's right. Yeah. So, so while we're talking about models, we're discussing zebrafish as a good model for mycobacterium leprae infection. But also, you talked a little bit about how Mycobacterium leprae might teach us some, some important things about nerve damage, mm -hmm. generally, that, that mm -hmm. we can learn and apply to other kinds of diseases yeah. characterized by nerve damage. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I think in particular, so let's step back for a minute and say, that, so, so the model that has been put forth based on mainly looking at cell culture systems has been that the leprosy bacterium directly damages the nerves that it binds to um, so, so nerves have a, um, a sort of supporting cell on them they're called the glia and glia make myelin and myelin is an insulating um, material that that nerves use to to speed up conduction among other things 
And the idea has been that the bacteria invade the, the myelin producing cells by binding to specific factors on them and then um, cause, dam cause nerve damage that way. And when we looked, we, another important thing is that we often just go in in an agnostic way. We're not out to find anything particular. We're just looking to see what do we see. But when we started to look, we started to realize that nerve damage was happening without the bacteria ever being inside the nerves. But they were around the nerves. And it turned out that the bacteria were in macrophages, innate immune cells um, that, that patrol nerves even normally. And they were within macrophages. And the, it turned out the macrophages were causing the nerve damage, but only when they had leprosy bacteria in them. And then, of course, we identified the, the bacterial factor turned out to be a surface uh, phenolic glycolipid. And, we turn, and it turns out that it causes an over-exuberant produ production of nitric oxide in the macrophages, and that then um, diffuses out, causes mitochondrial damage in the nerves and kills the nerve. And because we now know that it's not direct, but indirect through the immune system, now it becomes an immunological disease. And it becomes a disease of inflammation. And so now it puts it in, in, in the same category as diseases such as multiple sclerosis and uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome and other um, demyelinating conditions, uh, of which there are many. And, and because of this new understanding that we've had from our work, we now think that we can start to think about whether similar things might be going on in these other diseases. And if you start to look at those diseases, you start to see things that are common with leprosy. For example, mitochondrial damage is now starting to be recognized in multiple sclerosis. So that, 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 that it is in that sense that I meant that we might be able to uh, to take things into non-infectious diseases. Great, really interesting. So Becky, you talked about microbiomes and viromes that are in threatened environments, right? where the environment really influences the survival of the organisms living there. But a lot of what you do is out in the ocean. And I think most of the world thinks of the ocean as being one big soup where everything's all <laughs> mixed together. And if that was true, analyzing these local environments is really difficult. How do you sample these particular environments? Well, the main group of organisms that I work on are animals. And animals, regardless of being in the ocean, still maintain their own set of bacteria and viruses that can either contribute to the health of those animals or to their decline. And so most of the time when we're going out into the environment we're sampling, we simply take a sample just like you would in any of these other systems. You, go out, you collect a small sample. Since we do omics-based work, then you prepare the nucleic acids and you evaluate the composition of the microbes. What we also do is generally sample the surrounding environment to make sure that what we're looking at is the true composition of the animal and not some contaminant that mm -hmm. comes from this liquid place where they live. Um, and then um, we also like to do a number of experiments where we track the microbiomes and viromes over time, over space, over different species, or even during empirical experiments where we physically manipulate the environment, changing the conditions to best understand how threats to those habitats that we've hypothesized about, like climate change, like increased temperatures associated with climate change, like pollution. We physically manipulate those to characterize what should be going on in these natural conditions to confirm or deny those hypotheses about what's driving the decline of the system. And is it mediated by microbes or viruses? So in a laboratory environment, it's easy for us to, we, we, we talk about manipulating environments and, and having control experiments and it's easy for us to imagine how we would manipulate things. But in a complex environment like a coral reef, how do you manipulate the conditions in the environment and look at differences in, in microbial compositions? Well, there's, there's a few things we can do. So two of the main stressors that we evaluate are the effects of 
nutrient pollution, and the effects of overfishing on the environment. We know that overfishing is one of the main things that's thought to change how these communities look. And so we can actually physically manipulate that as well by removing fish from the habitats that we're interested in. We physically build underwater cages that essentially keep the corals from ever being bitten by those fishes or um, keep the fish from consuming the macroalgae in those places. And with the nutrients, um, we also can physically manipulate um, uh, how much nitrogen and phosphorus is in the water. So I'm sure everyone here has a garden probably, or, and you put fertilizer on it. Well, we do the same thing in the ocean. We physically add slow-release fertilizer to the environment as a way to track how normal nutrient pollution would cause changes in the microbiome. So there's a lot of physical underwater work and in some cases, we've done these experiments for over three years, where we're constantly changing these. Now, clearly, there's some things we can't change. We can't change temperature in a water-based system. But by looking at longitudinal data, we can track changes in the environment in terms of temperature over these longitudinal data sets, these long-term data sets, and just look when there's temperature spikes mm -hmm. or changes in water temperature that may correspond to changes in the microbiome. So we've heard a lot recently, a lot of really depressing news about the state of the health of the oceans, in particular of coral reef ecology. Do you think that manipulating the, the microbes in these environments might provide a way to, to adjust the changes that we're, that we're observing in response to things like climate change? Yeah, a lot of emphasis these days in the coral reef world is restoration of these habitats because it's gotten so bad, the decline of these habitats is so severe that now people are talking about raising corals in captivity and outplanting them, letting them go into the wild and ho with hopes that they'll repopulate the systems. And one of the things that we're concerned about is that we now know that there are particular kinds of microbes associated with these corals that are beneficial. And there are some that are detrimental. And so screening for corals that have the right combinations of microbes could be a really important thing for the success of those outplanting experiments. So you're hopeful? I am hopeful. It's been a very tough two years to be in the coral reef world because of the massive uh, decline just for the, the past two years. You know, I often say the Great Barrier Reef is the size of Italy. Imagine if Italy was covered in a forest and you cut down 25% of it in one year. That's what happened to the Great Barrier Reef last year. And so it's a very, very tough time to be in this field, but I'm, I'm an optimist and I'm not going to give up. And so I think there is still some hope. And you're the only one of us up here who gets to do their research with scuba tanks on. That's right. <laughs> and probably is very friendly with sharks. Yes, we get to see a lot of sharks. It's a good thing. Sharks are good for the environment and they're good for us. They, they usually just swim by if we're lucky. If we're lucky, we get to see them. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not lucky, well. <laughs> so, I'd like to remind the audience that if you'd like to ask a question, please use the microphone in the back. And for those of you who are watching online, please use the Facebook comments to post a question and we'll respond to your questions. So Julie, this is a, we started off talking about simplicity. Right. And I think one of the premises that you have is that you can apply these simplicity principles to very complex phenomena. So, so it would be interesting to hear your take on the higher level complexity that your colleagues just talked about. Right, right. Well, I think, I mean, in a sense also what both uh, Becky and Molly were describing uh, really are approaches to trying to understand um, in a sense, simple questions within these very complex environments. For example, in the context of leprosy, uh, we know the bacteria are associated with nerve damage, but actually drawing down to the molecular level to understand, you know, what's the molecule that induces it? What is the cell that's actually responsible if it's not the nerve itself, but through the macrophage? This is still, you know, really a very reductionist sort of piece-by-piece -piece dissection of this complex system. And I think going in there, again, not necessarily with a, a quantitative model in mind, but with a, a molecular model in terms of saying there has to be communication you know, from one level to the next uh, enables uh, enables you to take the, the system apart. Likewise, in the coral reefs, I mean, it's it's a wildly complex system, but the um, numbers of different creatures and organisms that are interacting in the coral reef 
is I think sort of reminiscent of all the different uh, macromolecules that are interacting within the level of the cell. And so looking at those interactions, the way they uh, play with one another, the way that if you change one thing that affects everything else, I really think applies you know, quite generally across all these different scales. Another thing that I think is very interesting, and as you said, you know, I'm, I'm a medical physician, microbiologist, but I think it, it, what I see th as the thread through all of this is that microbes are microbes and the human body or the zebrafish might be one environment that has some other complex responses right. to behaviors the same way you may see it on a petri dish or you may see it on a coral reef. So, and, and so what do you think about that idea? Well, I think um, that microbes are microbes and they respond, as you know, respond very differently depending on the environment. And, uh, and I think that has um, a, a lot of play in a, in a lot of things that we're all talking about because, for example, um, you know, when, the, when bacteria are, are in vivo, inside a macrophage, they might do a certain thing and that might have a certain consequence. Um, and uh, on the other hand, if they're in, uh, you, know, in coral you know, in coral reefs, good ones versus bad, you know, mm -hmm. healthy ones versus unhealthy ones, they might behave differently and, and so on. So um, I think that, that, um, that the concept of bacterial regulation, I think, is is uh, is sort of you know a, 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 an overarching in a player in all of this, and some of that can be um, understood through a more quantitative approach. It's something that ties us all together yeah. as microbiologists. Yeah. We have a question now from the audience. Yes, um, this is a question for Lale. So you you have a really elegant model where invasion of macrophages. Uh, result in an inflammatory response that, that causes nerve damage in zebrafish. So how do you test that model? And So in general, we, we have, uh, this is my first, this is our first foray into, into leprosy, I should say, and that's because uh, I had a, a particularly brave postdoctoral fellow, Cressida Madigan, who was willing to, to take on this project. Um, and but this is always a question that comes up for us and so what we've typically done is to use a combination of things in some cases we have been able to make a prediction in humans and then test that prediction this is I'm now backtracking and talking about some of our past work in tuberculosis so for example we had made a prediction that in, in a particular context, excessive inflammation with very specific inflammatory determinants would be detrimental. And we were able to test that in a cohort of uh, TB meningitis patients where we showed that indeed variants in that particular gene that caused that same exuberant over I inflammation, those were the people who succumbed to the disease. So, so, so that's an example of where we've been able to test the model. In this particular case, it's more that to our mind, the present, the existing, the prevalent model, the, the model that's out there didn't really fit with the clinical data. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's an example of where I think paying close attention to, to the human leprosy data, of which is abundant, and um, you know, and, and old. I mean, many people have done very beautiful work on leprosy over the decades. And the model that you need bugs to come and get into the nerves in large numbers didn't fit with, the lep with a vast majority of the leprosy neuropathy cases because in most of them, they, there are very few bacteria hardly any seen in the nerves, and yet there's plenty of nerve damage. But what we did know was that macrophages were almost always present. Mm -hmm. And also, nerve damage is a very early player in leprosy. That's also known if you really go and look at the clinical data. 
and macrophages are an early player in leprosy. And so I would say that I can't think of a direct way to test our model, but it certainly is consistent with the clinical literature. So, Becky, you talked about microbiomes, but you didn't talk about virons. <laughs> and probably mm -hmm. your claim to fame on TV is due to the viruses. Could, could you say something about that? Yeah, so um, for this meeting, I only talked about bacteria, but a lot of my past work is looking at the viruses associated with marine organisms or the marine system or marine sediments. And doing viral work is very different than doing microbiological work in terms of bacteria and archaea because the, the kind of bioinformatic resources mm -hmm. are not as available. And so viruses are these, these groups of biological entities that are really fascinating and so different than cellular organisms. They, they can evolve much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Their ability to replicate and their diversity of their uh, genomes, they can have RNA and DNA genomes, it's much more difficult to go out into the environment and characterize those communities because we know so little about them. So the foundational work is still not there yet to be able to go out and say, oh, we can characterize all these viruses. Even today, after 10 years of doing viral metagenomics, we still often will arrive at conclusions that we basically can assign 80% of our sequences to any known virus. But it's also really rewarding work because you are often at the, at the leading edge of discovery. So every time we go into the environment, we look at a new organism, we find all kinds of viral novelty. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting. It's challenging, and the, again, this, I think you point out to like the bravery of certain postdocs and students to do this kind of cutting edge work. It's challenging, but the rewards are really, are really, are really high. Um, and the viruses that we're interested, um, we look at both phage, which are the viruses that infect bacteria, but also the viruses that infect the eukaryotic organisms that are present either in the water or the corals. And as you mentioned, um, my, my claim to fame was being on the Colbert Report because we discovered that there was a variant of herpes in corals. And if you find herpes in corals, you get to be on cable TV. So, <laughs> um, and we've still, we've been following up with a lot of those hypotheses and we kind of find variants of all sorts of strange things like chlamydia or all sorts of VD style um, bacteria viruses present in marine organisms. And of course they're distant relatives, but it's, it's often really fun. And um, you gotta have to laugh at yourself a little bit every time you find something very strange in these systems, but it's fun. You know, along those lines and tied to what you do, I say, if I had $100 million to give as an X prize, uh -huh. the prize I would like to set up is to be able to see single molecule movement between bacteria in nature. Mm -hmm. Not on a petri dish, that's too easy. Yeah. Out in the swamp, out in the ocean, or within a host. Right? I mean, and so, what do you think? Is, it, is that going to happen? I hope so. I mean, the technologies for looking at real molecular level detail are just getting better and better. Every year it seems like there's a new revolution. Um, I heard this wonderful talk yesterday at one of the ASM sessions of, uh, from Kit Pogliano, who is collaborating with Elizabeth Villa um, in San Diego, actually UCSD, uh, using cryo-electron tomography to look at viral capsid assembly, phage capsid assembly inside individual bacterial cells, and just the ability to see mm -hmm. Individual molecules now in these, you know, unfixed hydrated specimens is spectacular, and they don't have motion yet. But then on the flip side, um, our ability in light microscopy to actually observe complex dynamics of individual molecules is also just exploding. So I think those things will come together fairly soon, and I think your vision is actually not not impossible. Well, I won't waste my hundred million dollars then. <laughs> we have another question well, from the audience. Will help you go faster, right. That's for sure. <laughs> we have another question from the audience. Hi, I um, <coughs> manage grant reviews at the NIH, uh -huh. and when we talk about models, I hear them all in infectious diseases. And reviewers have favorites. Right. They have preferences for different models, and they're allowed to have preferences, and they're allowed to express their enthusiasm or lack of it for models. My question to you is, how would you put that issue in context? What advice would you give to reviewers? I know you guys are reviewers. Uh, in terms of dealing with model preferences? 
Um, can I take that one? I, I'm not, I generally don't get NIH money, but um, I've proposed models many times um, to have them unceremoniously squashed. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you really have to emphasize the this, this explicit questions that you can answer with those models and right. why those are different in other systems. And I, I think Lolly's example is, is really clear. This was a beautiful organism to evaluate this infection with clear results. And it's easy to propose models because they're your favorite. But if they're not going to give you very precise and exact answers to the questions that you propose, they're really they're 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 more like I just like mice or I just like zebrafish because they're easy to raise. It. I mean, it really does have to be clear. And I I say that coming as from a reviewer of those kinds of grants. Right. Yeah, I, I I completely agree. And I think an important thing that all of us should always bear in mind is that different models are good for different kinds of questions. And so if you're interested in say a particular disease, you don't really want to necessarily get stuck on one particular model or one particular mode of infection. Uh, because you'll learn different things from looking at it from many different perspectives. So even in cases where it seems like, oh, we understand everything about how this particular infection works, say, in mice, doesn't mean that's necessarily going to be the same way it works in humans or the same way it works in, in marine organisms. Mm -hmm. So I think the multiplicity of models actually is the important thing rather than the strength or weakness of any individual. Along those lines, one of the places that is an enormous challenge for study sections is mathematical models. Mm -hmm. When you start trying to do things simple, the math gets complex. Right. <laughs> and so what, what do you think about that? In these study sections, is it that people don't understand the math well enough? Or what do you think? I think, I mean, if you're, if you're trying to use mathematical modeling in a field where it hasn't previously been applied, I think it's very much on the investigator to communicate it clearly and to you know, clearly explain why it's useful and why you can gain new insights from it. But you know, that being said, I think most areas of biology are now moving in more and more quantitative directions. And certainly we see with our cohort of graduate students who are coming in, you know, they're not only open to, but actually demanding training in quantitative methods and computational methods and in mathematical and quantitative thinking. So I think that's just the, the way that science is going. And I think, you know, as always, the young people will, will be the ones to do to this. Thing. But the answer is still the same. You've got to prove why your model what, is yeah, perfect right. for right. that question. Right. And, and I think another thing, for the environmental aspect, models are very important for scaling. Right. You know, you can look at a single individual and you can look at changes across that individual or at a, at a reef scale. But what about that whole ecosystem scale? So if you're looking at the dynamics of chemical properties in those reefs, you have to be able to scale up to say what it means for that entire ecosystem. And that requires math because we simply cannot sample all of our, our planet, we, and maybe someday we can, but we, it, it's, in, um, it's unlikely to, to um, be a good strategy. So <laughs> modeling and provides that a, a method for scaling up. And I, and I think that's really important and it should be considered as part of every major ecological um, proposal, I think. I would say, that I, I should say just in passing that uh, we've actually used zebrafish models and mathematical models in, uh -huh. a, in, a, in, in one paper, and it actually ended up doing very well. So I think, I think if, you're, if you're careful and have a very uh, a specific question and are sensible about it, and it all makes, and it, and it fits, and answers a question, then and looks, well, at least we got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think this also ties, what you said about the environment also ties to infectious disease. Yeah. If you begin to think about transmission mm -hmm. and yeah. evolution, and fundamentally, you're looking at a very large pool. Right. Very similar. So, so Julie, one of the things that you discussed as well was the idea of a, a simplified model as a constraint for future for future studies. So, right. you discussed times when a, a simple model isn't enough to to provide right. an explanation, but those models can still inform future studies. And, and I think you were discussing mathematical models and physical models when when you discussed that, but. Uh, this is a concept that seems like it applies to, to models. Yeah, today. yeah, that's absolutely true. So if you're if you're interested in complex interactions between organisms and the environment, um, given you know the limitations of our human intellect, sometimes it's very useful to start off by thinking about pairwise interactions, and then think about introducing 
you know, additional complexity sort of one layer at a time. Um, but sort of starting off simple and then building up from there and trying to specifically locate the places where you know, you think you know what's going on, you think you know what's going on, but then all of a sudden something doesn't quite fit. You know, that's really where discoveries are made, are the places where your simple thinking, your intuition, all of a sudden breaks down, breaks down in a very specific way. So yes, I think that that uh, overall argument, I think applies, again, across across scales and across different kinds of research as well. And, and Becky, this is something also, in, in your laboratory, you you do some work, you've, you've been out in the environment and you've started to, to move to doing some manipulation of microbial communities in the laboratory. Yeah, yeah so we've been, um, it's, it's great to look at these big pictures, but it's also very, very nice to go reductionist and to try to really answer the questions of mechanism of what's going on. And what are the intimate relationships among the microbiome? And so we've been manipulating host microbiomes by adding predators and prey. And we call this our alien versus predator experiment. <laughs> where we, we take pathogens and we add them to the microbiome and we see how the pathogen changes the microbiome over the course mm -hmm. of the infection and even mm -hmm. after the infection. And often what we see is the pathogen will spike and then you'll get a whole bunch of opportunists come in. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it's those opportunists that are correlated with the declines of the host. So perhaps they're more, they might not be the initial pathogens, but they're ultimately the nail in the coffin. And so we've been tracking that and at the same time we've been adding predators of those pathogens and seeing how they can either ameliorate the effect of those pathogens or cause other downstream negative effects. And so we can, we can essentially remove the pathogen with the predator and clear up the disease. In this case, we are looking at this one particular disease. But the, interestingly enough, the predator also consumes other aspects of the microbiome. Mm -hmm. Now whether that, it didn't seem to have a negative effect, but whether it could in the long run, we don't know. But it's been, we have to do all this cold culturing and it's been really interesting to, to see these interactions, these minute interactions. And we've been tracking them. We worked with Roman Stocker to actually physically and uh, visualize the interactions between these predator and prey. Mm -hmm. And one of the mathematical models that has come into this and the discovery that was really shocking to us is that one of the biggest effects of this interaction is a physical property of the system uh -huh. is viscosity. Mm -hmm. And so the viscosity changes when you go into the animal tissue and in that high viscous system, the predators have an advantage because the prey can't get away. Because the prey can't get away as fast. Mm -hmm. That's great. So essentially the prey are kind of trapped in this uh -huh. high viscous mm -hmm. system, but it doesn't affect the predators at all. Uh -huh. And so the predators end up winning in that microbiome system, but out in the water column they have no effect. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. So and you know, an interesting aspect of thinking about those in the lab experiments is when you think about a concept that if things normalized reefs would come back on their own. And you think about this idea of saving the good organisms. In a way, it's like doing a fecal transplant on yeah. the environment. On the ocean. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we know the good guys, and if we can find the healthy component, we could potentially you know, add, add coral probiotics or reef probiotics mm -hmm. that can help um, um, improve the resilience or resistance of those communities to environmental change, for example. I mean, I think we're a long way from that. And, I'm a little resistant to start adding stuff to the environment, sure. um, um, but I think it, if we get desperate enough, perhaps, perhaps. Um, well, this has been really fun, but I think we are about out of time now. So we'd like to thank our guests. Um, we'd like to thank Julie and um, Lolita and Becky, and uh, we'd also like to thank those of you watching in the audience here in the studio, and as well as the audience watching us online. So, um, you've been watching Best of Microbe 2017. Please stay tuned for other great programming through ASM Live from here at Microbe 2017 in New Orleans. And we hope you come back and hear a little bit more about the Best of Microbe tomorrow afternoon at between 2 and 2.30. I'm happy to be your host. I'm Stanley Malloy. I'm Jeffrey Malloy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.
They tell you to put your chin right there. <laughs> and I became an ASM member in 1981. 95? Um, since 2008. I joined ASM in 1974. I've been an ASM member for 41 years. I think I first became a member in 1989. Seems like all my career. I'm willing to bet it's a decade. My first ASM was 1993. I still have a picture of me holding the program open, sitting on the hotel room bed, really excited because for the first time ever I saw my name in print associated with microbiology. When I was a graduate student at Purdue in 1980, it was the thing. I mean, if you were going to be a microbiologist, you joined the ASM. It was just really that simple. ASM is very special to me because I became a member in 2002, and when I first attended the, the meeting at Salt Lake City, Utah, I met my PhD thesis mentor, Dr. Arturo Casadevall. And so ASM kind of introduced me to the PhD world. Definitely the most important thing is that ASM has provided me with a graduate fellowship. So they've helped support me during my graduate training. Um, in addition, I've gotten a lot of networking opportunities and I've met a lot of really great people through ASM. And we can share our work and connect and they can teach me things that I don't know and I can teach them things that they don't know. And just that partnership and working together, that's what scientists do, to share your work. And it's the most exciting thing to learn about new projects. ASM has actually done a whole lot of work and given me the kind of exposure I've not, I wouldn't have had if I'm not a member of ASM. Many brains are better than one. So it's a great thing. It's a really member-driven organization. I love that. I've always loved that. Could make the bigger, the better, the, the more the merrier. You want to do microbiology? Become a member.